Hello and welcome to Voices of Agriculture here on RFD. We're coming to you once again from the Lone Star State of Texas, where summer has come early, temperatures are rising, and parts of South Texas are suffering from epic drought. We'll have a report on that, but first up, a group of farmers traveled to the nation's capital recently to talk about national issues. It was a very different nation's capital that was visited by Texas farmers and ranchers a few weeks ago. More than 130 county leaders of Texas Farm Bureau traveled to Washington, D.C. on March 30th to April 2nd as part of the organization's annual National Affairs Awards trip. The Texas farmers and ranchers brought with them a list of concerns that include increased environmental regulation, free trade agreements that continue to languish in Congress, and the fear of a trade war with Mexico and opportunities to enhance trade with Cuba. Hale County farmer Bobby Byrd admits to being discouraged about the weight of the proposed changes in the country and how many could possibly have a negative impact on agriculture. I feel like there's so much distance between a lot of, a lot of times with the people we talk to and uh, uh, they've got other things on their mind right now. Many of the farmers on the trip were concerned that the changes in Washington could bring about an avalanche of new environmental regulations that many farm families could not survive. Probably a worst case scenario, but people seem to think that maybe one day we may have to have a permit to plow, you know, because of the dust situation. Wendell worries that a dramatic increase in environmental regulations could drive farmers out of business due to the cost involved and the fact that time-consuming permitting might not allow critical management functions at the proper time. A pollution point source is a fixed object, such as a pipe that discharges into streams and rivers. Non-point source is harder to pin down and includes the application of agricultural chemicals. The removal of two words, navigable waters, in the regulations applies the tough point source rules to all waters. That means permits might be required for the simplest of on-farm spraying operations. That's going to be a timely issue. It's going to be a costly issue uh, from when we want to spray and the time that is issued to get in to, to save our crops. On trade issues, the Farm Bureau leaders found a friendly ear with two members of the Texas congressional delegation, one a Republican the other a Democrat. Republican Kevin Brady of the Woodlands is concerned about the trade positions of the new administration, but he is optimistic about the eventual passage of several free trade agreements. We're a little worried because they sort of ran against trade, but our thinking is, you know, we're so open to people selling into the United States, but when we try to do the same, you know, we get a lot of barriers, so I think we need to knock down those barriers. One way of knocking them down, according to Brady, is the adoption of several free trade agreements pending in Congress. FTAs waiting for a vote include those negotiated with Panama, Colombia, and South Korea. Democrat Henry Cuellar of Laredo also supports those free trade agreements and is concerned about a trade war with Mexico. In March, Congress passed and President Obama signed legislation terminating a pilot program that allows some Mexican trucks to operate near the border. Since the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, calls for this kind of arrangement, the U.S. is in violation. Mexico retaliated with $2.4 billion in tariffs against U.S. products entering Mexico. Texas has so far escaped major harm, but there's plenty of worry to go around. When they talk about safety, keep in mind that the latest Department of uh, Transportation uh, study shows, the U.S. Department of Transportation showed that for American trucks, the out of service rate was 21 percent. For the Mexican trucks on this pilot program, it was at 7 percent. Cuellar called the situation a trade war that the U.S. started. Brady says he worries about damage to other trading relationships. Also on the trade front, the Texas farmers and ranchers were encouraged about the possibility of expanding trade with Cuba. The island nation has quietly risen to the top 25 on the list of buyers of U.S. agricultural products. In fact, the U.S. is now Cuba's number one supplier of those products. Many believe it could be even better. Nueces County farmer and rancher Daniel Bluntzer is looking forward to an expanded Cuban market. Being right on the coast, having grain sorghum, having cotton, having corn, having uh, uh, beef cattle, uh, we were a, we're a prime market for, for Cuba. Very very close proximity. Perhaps the most important aspect of the Farm Bureau's trip to Washington was an understanding of the need to be politically active as a very different approach to governing impacts those that live and work on the land. For many in the state of Texas, Hurricane Ike has faded into a distant memory. 
but farmers and ranchers on the Gulf Coast of Texas are still battling the after effects of that storm. Salt water left behind by the storm has caused serious problems and most of the fences were simply washed away. Matt Felder has a report. The ground may be soft, but the work still hard. The sounds of hammers moving feverishly is a common scene in southeast Texas these days. Some eight months after Hurricane Ike made landfall in Galveston, the rebuilding efforts are far from over. The devastation still lingering. It's been really tough. I guess the main thing, it disrupted all of our uh, lives. Our cattle have been displaced and fences down and our land is salted out where we can't plant our crops. The fourth generation rancher lost close to 200 head of cattle to the 20 foot storm surge. The cattle that did survive face an uphill battle with saturated land and limited fresh water. The shining light in all the demise is that those ravaged by the storm are not alone in the fight to get back on track. The rebuilding effort was set in motion long before Ike came ashore and with it help from across the country. It's an American tradition that farmers help their neighbors. There's community and we're all in this together and uh, we, can, uh, we can get a whole lot more done if we lock arms. The government agencies, the uh, cattlemen's associations, faith-based groups, they all pull together and get a big job done. It's thrilling. Schlegel, along with 275 volunteers from 19 states, have shown up to shore up some 1,700 miles of fence, enough to stretch from Brownsville to Canada. 30,000 head of cattle once roamed the five-county area of the bayou. Today, it's down to 7,000, with many still unaccounted for, most likely washed out with the tide. On April 25th, Texas Agriculture Commissioner Todd Staples strapped on his mud boots and grabbed his work gloves and hammer to kick off Operation New Fences. Yet another reminder that a helping hand is still needed. Agriculture is the backbone of the Texas economy. And we know that producers face adversity each and every day and every year. But when you have a catastrophe like Hurricane Ike, it gives an opportunity for the true spirit and character of Texas to shine. The Texas Department of Agriculture, Texas AgriLife Extension, and various cattlemen's associations headed up the effort of donating fencing supplies to the operation. On the morning of the 25th, MJ Fertilizer and Winnie became ground zero for the operation to begin. Our life intertwines with our customers so much, it's just, it's a, it's a community, it's a family community around here. All of the Southeast Texas producers, it's like, a, it's like an extended family. And uh, if their problems become your problems and, and vice versa, we share everything down here. Volunteers say more than 300 miles of fence have been replaced since January, evidence that a full recovery won't happen overnight. What was wiped out in a day will take years to rebuild. Still, you would never know about the long road that lies ahead by the sheer amount of optimism that seems to grow with the placement of each new post. It's wonderful. It's just nice to see friendly faces. These guys are uh, wanting to come out and help, and uh, that's, that, that's what it's all about. All signs that the Lone Star Southeast will thrive once again. And that's really what being a Texan is all about. We might be down, but you can't count us out. That spirit that was alive in 1836, it's alive today in 2009. These individuals are rebuilding their future one fence post at a time. For Voices of Agriculture, Matt Felder, Winnie, Texas. Following these messages, we'll have more of Voices of Agriculture. Are you a Texan? Are you a farmer or a rancher? Is Texas agriculture important to you? Do you care about the future of rural Texas? Perhaps you're concerned about property rights, stewardship of the land, and the next generation of farm and ranch families. If any of this describes your thinking, then you belong in the Texas Farm Bureau. Make your voice heard in the organization that is the voice of Texas agriculture. Call your county Farm Bureau office or visit us on the web at www.txfb.org. Some parts of Texas have been blessed with rainfall in recent months, but that does not include South Texas, where the drought has reached exceptional proportions. Tom Nicoletti files this report. Hardly a speck of life has broken through the flat parched plains of the coastal bend. By the looks of it, you would think it was winter and not the plentiful growing season of spring and summer. Fields normally full of lush grains and cotton are lifeless as far as the eye can see. There's been times that, you know, it's been dry, but normally it seems like we always got to crop up, got it going. But uh, this year is, it's such a huge area, it's a first, I've never seen nothing like it. Losses throughout the coastal bend are quickly mounting. 75% of the area's grain crop has failed. 
An average year for Driscoll Grain Co-op is anywhere from 12 to 1,400 carloads. That's about 100,000 pounds of grain per carload. What does make it to harvest won't be a bumper crop by any stretch. The grain that has broken through resembles more of a volunteer crop, sprouting here and there, in all shades of green and should be headed out, but isn't. Penny pinching is the name of the game, as the trick now is trying to stay out of the red. It'll be hard to just, you know, keep the doors open this year. We'll probably, some of the part-time help I'm sure we'll lay off just to cut back expenses and just, we'll just skimp by on those bare necessities for the next year. For area cotton gins, it's the same tune, different verse. About 95% of the cotton crop has been failed out. Most of it didn't even reach daylight, forcing many cotton gins in the area to keep their doors shut for the season. True gin is one that may run silent. In a typical year, the gin turns out around 30 to 35,000 bales of cotton. This year, it's a different story. They have like 1,200 acres left that's still growing, but that's got a long ways to go till harvest. So, you know, even if it, even if it go to harvest, it'd probably be maybe 1,000 bales, which is, you know, a drop in a bucket for what, what they normally have. As more and more fields are released and crops zeroed out, the paperwork is signed and crop insurance checks have already started rolling in. But the full wrath of the drought is reaching way beyond the farm gate. There is no trickle-down effect for the ag-related businesses when the farmer gets an insurance check. He puts that in the bank naturally and tries to cover his expenses, but there's nothing for the grain elevators, the combine people, the truck drivers, the crop dusters, you know, chemical companies. It goes a lot further than a lot of people realize. Brown runs a three-plane business, Nueces Ag Service, in Robstown. He has not turned a prop since December and does not expect to be called to do so anytime soon. If they declare the disaster area, I'll qualify for a low interest SBA loan, which is like 4%, but that's just digging your debt hole that much deeper. And uh, most of us have got, already got SBA loans and we don't want any more. Driscoll Grain and True Gin are teaming up, working to minimize expenses, mainly when it comes to labor. Workers for True Gin have been contracted to build new offices and help with maintenance at Driscoll Grain. The last such drought dates back to the 1950s, the locals say this one is worse. Much of the area has not seen any rain since September, and experts say the coastal bend is some 18 inches shy of normal rainfall and quickly climbing. Farmers are left scratching their heads on where to go from here. For some, replanting is a good possibility. Most farmers, such as the Smiths, are choosing to lick their wounds and move on. It's just wild to drive around this country and look at all this blank dirt. It's it's. I hope I never see it again. For Voices of Agriculture, Tom Nicoletti, Nueces County. Along with that drought, the need for hay and feed for livestock has risen dramatically. Ed Wolf talked to one farmer who has risen to the challenge, donating hay supplies to those in need. When the Malone family near Tyler checked their mail a few months ago, they found the usual, bills, some junk mail, and the March 6th edition of Texas Agriculture. A few days later, over a bowl of cereal, Don Malone picked up the magazine and began reading about the historic Texas drought and how it's affecting producers across the state. One story in particular caught his attention. I read that about Bobby and Sam and the troubles that they were going through. So when I got into my office that morning, I, I just called information and got their phone number and I called their, uh, called their home and didn't get anyone, left, left a message on their answering machine. And later that day, uh, they called me back. That would begin a string of phone conversations as well as a friendship with brothers Bobby and Sam Burnham, who have been forced by the drought to burn prickly pear cactus on their ranch near Marble Falls to give their cattle something to eat. Malone was moved by their plight and offered assistance in the form of several rolls of hay he had carried over from last year. Even though they're separated by almost 300 miles, they're still neighbors, and Malone wanted to help any way he could. If you've ever been in the cow business, at some point in time, you've always been in trouble. If it's not drought and water, you know, it's, um, it's prices or it's, there's always something. After working out a few details, the first load of round bales arrived at the Burnham's Hill Country Ranch early one Thursday morning. The 37 bales were a welcome sight for these fifth generation ranchers who say if it wasn't for the generosity of this fellow ag producer, their ranching days may have been numbered. A guy like that, Mr. Malone, uh, we thank the God every day for what he has, has helped us out so that we got a few more days now that we can go on. 
The brothers say they, as well as many hit hard by the drought, can't afford to buy several rolls of hay a day at $60 apiece to sustain their herds through these dry times, which is their motivating factor for strapping on a propane tank and burner and scorching the needles off acres of cactus. When you have to fire one of those propane burners up and I don't know what the temperature on the other end of it is, but it gets pretty hot on this backside too, and especially if we have to go into the summer. Unfortunately, burning pear will have to continue for a while. Though the ranch has received a few showers, Sam is quick to point out that it doesn't rain grass. So the cattle will have to survive on a combination of cactus and Malone's hay until a greenup occurs. But by the looks of the herd, the cattle are just as happy to see the hay as anyone. It really does help a whole lot to uh, keep the cows in, in good physical condition and, and I think mental condition too, <laughs> you know, to know that they're going to get something other than, than burnt prickly pear for, for breakfast every day. Don Malone has given the Burnham brothers hope for survival and forged a friendship along the way, even though they've never actually met, which is something he hopes to change next time he finds himself near Marble Falls. But this East Texas rancher will be the first one to tell you this act of kindness wasn't meant to draw attention to himself or get a pat on the back. But he does hope others will follow suit and lend a hand to those hit hard by this epic drought. Maybe by me helping, maybe someone else will, you know, will read the article that was in there and maybe someone else will decide, you know, hey, I can help a little too. Just wait long enough and like I say, you'll be in trouble yourself at some point in time. So, you know, if you get the chance to help someone, you know, jump in there and try it. For Voices of Agriculture, I'm Ed Wolf near Tyler. We'll have more on Voices of Agriculture right after this. Attending college is a goal of many young people, but getting on campus is very expensive. That's where Texas Farm Bureau can help. As members of the Texas Farm Bureau, students can compete for thousands of dollars in scholarships through Texas Farm Bureau's annual statewide contests, free enterprise speech, talent find, and Miss TFB. The Texas Farm Bureau, making a difference for agriculture and rural Texas. Agriculture is Texas' renewable industry, not only growing food and fiber for Texas families, but creating one in five Texas jobs. I'm Mike Barnett, editor of Texas Agriculture. In our publication, you'll read profiles of the trendsetters of agriculture in the Lone Star State. We'll bring you profiles of farmers and ranchers surviving and thriving on the land and the issues shaping the future of rural Texas. Read all about it in Texas Agriculture, an exclusive benefit of your Texas Farm Bureau membership. It's somewhat controversial in some quarters, but many farmers and ranchers are participating in harnessing the wind for electrical power. Matt Felder traveled to South Texas where there is a boom in that form of energy production. It's the first Texas wind farm east of Abilene, 118 turbines, each taller than the Statue of Liberty. The 10,000 acre wind farm sits on 235,000 acres owned by the Kennedy Foundation just south of Kingsville. It's like, you know, the first oil well that was developed here uh, and how much that has helped in providing energy. This country became great because of its energy availability. We're playing a very important part for the development of Texas. The Gulf Wind Project developed by Babcock and Brown is not alone in the renewable renaissance. Just next door on the other half of the ranch operated by the Kennedy Charitable Trust is the Panasco Wind Power Project made up of 84 turbines all run by Iberdrola Renewables. Together the two wind farms pump out 485 megawatts of electricity enough power for more than 150,000 homes. Most of those will be in South Texas and San Antonio. There's a longer term strategic objective for the U.S. to generate more energy itself. Secondly, renewable energy is good for the planet. It's uh, zero carbon emissions. And there's a lot of untapped resource in the U.S. that should be used. Set to become operational this past May, the idea for the project first came about in 2002. Research on the area's wind capability went on for several years along with extensive wildlife impact studies. Our main concern, of course, was the impact on the environment and particular wildlife. When we analyzed it and we looked at it, visited the site in West Texas and how much noise it makes and how much space it takes, we felt there was not anything to be concerned about. Today, wildlife and cattle can be seen maneuvering within the wind farm. State-of-the-art avian radar is also in place. When high numbers of birds fly into the area under low visibility, the turbines will automatically shut down. Unlike West Texas, the state's southern wind, though less powerful, is more attractive. The wind blows out here during the times of the day that power generation is mostly needed in this part of Texas, which is late morning, early and late afternoon, we get our highest wind flows. 
Given the nature of the organization is the millions of dollars generated for both the trust and foundation will have but one destination, charity. Since its inception in 1960, the Kennedy Foundation has handed out more than $240 million. The new wind farms will serve as another catalyst for support. This is the kind of stuff that we need down here if we're going to take South Texas from being the, the, the least educated, the least economically developed of all the regions in the United States, it's going to help us move out of that. But while the growing industry claims much promise of prosperity to the region, whispers of concern are circling as to what long-term consequences may blow in with it. 30 miles north of Corpus Christi, outside of Taft, the Papalote Creek wind farm developed by Eon Climate and Renewables will house 109 turbines generating 180 megawatts enough to power 54,000 homes. It's new and exciting. The wind energy is certainly something that Farm Bureau wants uh, landowners to have the privilege of, of exploring and, and developing. And that income is very important to those landowners who choose to be involved in this project. Much like the wind farms on the Kennedy Ranch, most of that power will head north to San Antonio. The $200 million project is set to rake in $30 million in tax revenue for the area over the next 20 years. But unlike the wind farms on the Kennedy Ranch, this latest green addition is being built on rich farmland, not rangeland. Creating a genuine concern as more farmland is taken out of production. Jeff Stapper's home is when the inside of the wind farm, one that has raised many concerns. The only concern I have is what it's going to do to the land just because of the roads that are having to be put into each tower. With the very flat terrain that we have here, you know, you start making adjustments and that's going to impact drainage and, you know, I don't know that everybody's thought through that. Currently, South Texas has fallen victim to an epic drought, and any sort of flooding has been a minimal concern at best. However, that could all change. The area has been prone to flooding in the past, but those with Eon Climate and Renewables assure the homework has been done. We have worked with every landowner to make sure the road design works with their current and continued farming operations, Adam Cohen with Eon Climate and Renewables said in an email. We have installed culverts and roads in a manner that does not disrupt the natural flow of water and goes with crop rows as much as possible. Construction on the towers began in March and company leaders say the wind farm should be operational towards the end of the year. Texas Farm Bureau leaders helped pave the way for the wind farm, writing letters to help resolve a dispute with the FAA. However, it's the flight pattern of more agriculture-related aircraft that is raising the eyebrows of local producers. With the bow weevil eradication, that's obviously a big concern. You know, we're trying to really knock that guy out. And, you know, if we get in a situation where we've got cotton planted around the wind farms and it does go to raining and we can't get in there with, with ground rigs to spray, I guess the weevil will, will continue to reproduce. It's no secret the new industry has brought about very strong feelings both for and against the wind farms and many unanswered questions when it comes to the full effect the 400-foot towers will have on the area. In any case, South Texas expects to remain the new frontier for wind power as more companies look to tap into one of the coast's most abundant resources, the wind. For Voices of Agriculture, Matt Felder, Sarita, Texas. Well, that's Voices of Agriculture for this week. Join us every week on RFD for a look at agriculture and rural life across these United States. When we again visit the state of Texas, we'll have a complete report on the Texas legislative session. Summer has come early to the state of Texas. That means two things. We need to be very careful with fire and please do everything you can to conserve water. For a look at agriculture in the state of Texas, visit our website, www.txfb.org or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Join us again next time on Voices of Agriculture.